Hi, everyone. Welcome to Cafe IBTTA. I'm Pat Jones. Our guest today is Diane Gutierrez Cacchetti, Commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Transportation and President of IBTTA. Previously, Diane served as Executive Director and CEO of Florida's Turnpike Enterprise, and before that, as Executive Director of the New Jersey Turnpike Authority. I could go on and on about Diane's professional background and accolades, but I'm not gonna do that because we wanna save time for your questions and Diane's responses. So Diane, welcome to Cafe IBTTA. It's great to have you with us. Good morning, Pat. It, it's wonder, wonderful to be here on this somewhat cold and anticipated snowy day in New Jersey. Well, this is Cafe IBTTA where we drink coffee and talk about things that are interesting, relevant, uplifting, and fun. And today, a big shout out to the IBTTA Board of Directors, which is having its virtual winter board meeting over the next three days. We are taking your questions and comments and we wanna get started right away. So in the chat, tell us a word or phrase that expresses your hope for the new year. Tell us in the chat, using all panelists and attendees or everyone, give us your hope your feelings of hope for the new year. Tell us. All right, lots of good stuff coming in. COVID less, freedom of movement, normalcy, freedom, healthy, no more viruses, more learning, good, healthy, togetherness, national interoperability, thank you, Rush, uh, peace, reduced leakage, end of COVID, seeing each other again. No more masks. I don't know if we're going to be able to do that too soon. Progress. New infrastructure investments. Ah, there's a good one. We could talk about that today, Diane. Exactly. All right. Well, keep those good thoughts about the new year coming in. And now we're going to turn to Diane. Diane, your theme as IBTJ president this year is resilience, leadership, and opportunity. How did you come up with that theme? And what does it mean to you? Well, the theme itself was really, I think, a really good collaboration, Pat, between you, Wanda, and me in, in talking through, I think, what is what I see is so important um, every day to the businesses we run. And so when we think generally, we say terms like resilience and leadership and opportunity, we think about, you know, you know resilience is, is part of climate change and, and leader, opportunity and leadership have to do with new opportunities, you know, we, it, some in the chat with new investments, new funding. For me, these are different words. Um, for me, in this year, I look at resilience as being the resilience of the human spirit as we return to our offices, hopefully, and get to stay there for a while and begin to come back together after what have been two very difficult years, maybe two and a half by the time it happens. Um, and the resilience of each of us to um, come back to work, engage each other, um, understand our views. So there's so much we are all at odds with today. Um, and leadership is going to be those of us who, whether we're in a true what I'll call leadership role, whether it's a commissioner or an executive director or a CEO of a company or a senior management uh, professional, um, really looking at folks that lead in their small units at work. Leadership is at every level of an organization, formalized or not. Um, and, and really focusing on developing those skills that help us to work better together. And opportunity is just what it is. It's opportunity to in, embrace all that has happened to us, to apply what we've learned, um, to take the best of what have been bad times um, and make something of it. And we always have the opportunity to do that every day in every part of our lives. And so thinking about those things and the resiliency of the human spirit and, and the need for us to come together and embrace all that has happened I wanna take a moment um, just to reflect on Jeffrey Parker's life and his professional career. Um, you know, I'm not sure anybody, and, and I, I feel mostly for my colleagues in Georgia, you know, Chris Tomlinson and Russell McMurray and all of the folks down there who work day to day with Jeffrey and lost a dear friend and colleague and so many of, other us, of us in the business. I, I just think it's important to understand, you know, we never know what is happening with someone, sometimes unless we ask. And, and we've lost a little bit of time again, um, 
the art of some small talk, you know, how are you, what's going on, everything good with you, um, picking up a phone and say, want to grab a cup of coffee. We're so tied up in, you know, our own bottom lines and there's nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. Um, we cannot lose, um, we cannot lose the connections of the human spirit. And this picture is so beautiful. This picture with Chris and, and Frank and Jeff, it's just a reminder that every one of us has a story. Every one of us uh, needs others. Um, and, and we hold Jeff up in our prayers and his family in our prayers. Um, and remember um, that all of us are here for each other always. Uh, and we're only ever a phone call away. Um, and we just take a moment to reflect on Jeff um, before we continue on. Thanks for letting me do that, Pat. Thanks, Diane, for that uh, beautiful expression of love about uh, Jeff and uh, Jeffrey and uh, beautiful sentiment. Thank you so much. Diane, I wanna ask you about two other guys. Uh, you are the third pandemic president of IBTTA. But there are two guys that went before you, Mark Compton and Samuel Johnson. How about those guys and their leadership? Well, I like the those guys reference because we got a lot of those guys in New Jersey, right? That's how we, we refer to things here, I guess. Um, their leadership was phenomenal. And, and I have to say, um, I like to use the analogy of uh, playing golf. And, you know, when you putt um, and you're in a foursome, you, whoever putts first is kind of the unlucky guy. So Samuel was, had the toughest job. Um, Mark was able to go to school on Samuel's putt um, and see the line and see the cup and hopefully, you know, get that ball where it needed to be and move on. And I get to go to school on both of their leadership styles, understand how they handled the pandemic, understand how they made some tough decisions um, in a time when, uh, it was not easy to keep everybody rowing the boat in the same direction. Um, and so I admire both of them so much for their leadership um, during difficult times. And like I said, um, by the time Andy gets here, three of us will have putted and hopefully Andy will be able to sink his putt uh, in one stroke. That's going to be the goal. Diana, no, I know a lot of people are going to go to school on your putt. Uh, and uh, it's, it's great that you've got uh, Mark and, uh, and Samuel to, uh, to show you the line. You know, most everybody knows about uh, your role as the commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Transportation and your previous role at Flores Turnpike Enterprise. But tell us how you got started in the transportation business. I'm curious about that. So I often tell people I kind of tripped and fell into transportation. Um, I worked uh, at the state of New Jersey in the Department of Treasury while I was in graduate school and worked with a really, really smart guy who um, I still admire and still, still speak to. Um, when I finished graduate school, he had left to go to the New Jersey Turnpike Authority, and I had decided to take a job with IBM in North Carolina. And so I was really... Um, um, wanted to work in human resources. That's what my master's degree was in. It was in human resources, industrial relations. I really, at some point, wanted to be able to be a mediator, a labor mediator. Um, and so when my boss called me back, he, he, my old boss called me from the turnpike and he said, look, if that's what you want to do, you know, come to the turnpike and do it, you know, come to the turnpike and, you know, you can work in those areas. And I came to the turnpike on November 13th of 1989 um, Governor, King, uh, Governor Florio had won the election. My boss was a Republican. Governor Florio was a Democrat. And I'm like, my timing is really off. Um, but it wasn't. And so um, he stayed at the turnpike for a little while. Um, I settled in working in the law department, doing contract administration work, not anything I had anticipated. Um, but over time, um, you know, God is funny. He moves his hand where he knows we need to be. Uh, working in the law department gave me the opportunity to really learn what the Turnpike Authority did, you know, not just the human resources part, but what an agency of that magnitude did. For the first six months, Pat, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you, I hated it. I'm like, who wants to talk about pavement and concrete all day long? Um, but once I allowed myself to kind of open my eyes and shake off the, the resistance, I realized just how broad a reach a toll, toll authority had. I mean, they were so much more than 
pavement and concrete. They were service plazas and they were, you know, we had wastewater treatment plants and we had huge labor contracts and we had, you know, huge financial issues. And so there was real estate issues. There was so many different areas of business that you could come from almost any walk of life and find a job in a toll authority and be very successful. And, you know, from that day on, um, I did everything I could to absorb as much as I could about how a turnpike authority runs. And I was given a tremendous amount of opportunity. I had great leadership and mentors. And I was, you know, it was kind of history after that, you know, 21 years of really just belonging to a family unlike, unlike any other. In the chat, I'd like to hear from all the engineers out there what they think about talking about pavement and concrete all day long. So, Diane, as a commissioner of a major State Department of Transportation, you are uh, really concerned about safety. And we often talk about the technologies to enhance safety, that they're a big priority. In your role, how do you think about advancing safety? Well, safety comes on, on two, two major levels, right? I think the first is the safety of the, the traveling public, the folks that we serve every day making sure that we're using the best technology so that they can, uh, they can arrive safely at their destinations, that their travel is smooth. Those are very important to me. It's also the safety of our employees and our contractors and our partners who work out on our roadways. So for me, you know, again, I, I'm a belie firm believer of not reinventing the wheel. There's probably not one issue that one group of us has, has that another group hasn't already addressed. And I'll give you a good example. Um, our folks here in New Jersey um, are starting to see for the very first time wrong way driver accidents. Um, not something that's been very common up here. Uh, yet during my time in Florida, you know, we had to address that problem. It was very serious, a um, lot more wrong way accidents than we would have liked to see. And the department was able to deploy technology that really helped address wrong way driving. So when I think about safety, um, and that's one example. I think about being able to collaborate on technologies, especially that particular one, you know, sticks out because I said to my guys, don't reinvent the wheel, call John Easterling down at Florida's Turnpike and he'll tell you what Florida did. And, and let's not, let's not spend a lot of time, you know, uh, waste a lot of time thinking when we can really, you know, again, go to school on someone else, learn from someone else's experiences and share that. And that's what IBTTA is so great for. You know, I remember Pat doing those uh, presentations at IBTTA meetings and talking through, you know, new technologies, you know, and we have such great partners in that regard um, that, that really can help us learn as operators about what's available to us um, and make sure both our travelers and our employees are safe. You know, I look at the great work Pennsylvania has done and Maryland has done in the move over law. Um, you know, I hope to replicate that in New Jersey to keep our employees and our first responders safe. Um, there is there is much to be done and much to be learned and, and truly much to be shared um, from those who have already gone before us in some of those areas. Diane, I love that you talk about meetings and collaboration and all the learning that, that comes from the meetings at IBTTA. And, and it, I think about this a lot. If if you meet somebody who knows anything about IBTTA anywhere in the world, mm -hmm. chances are the first thing they'll say about IBTTA is about the meetings. They'll talk about meetings. Tell us what IBTTA meetings mean to you, at, both in, in person and uh, virtual under, under this COVID pandemic. You know, Pat, for me, IBTTA is just, it's a family, right? So. I, I participate in associations that are much, much larger than IBTTA and they're successful. Don't get me wrong. But I think the real, the, the special piece of IBTTA is that we're really a niche community. Uh, I think that for me, um, it's seeing our, seeing my colleagues from across the country, developing those relationships that remind us we can pick up the phone and talk to folks whenever we need to. Um, whether it's just to, to you know, vent about an, an issue or you know, collect ideas. Um, IBTTA, going to an IBTTA meeting is like going home, right? It's like going to a family reunion. I think that's what we saw certainly in Anaheim. And I expect we'll see a lot more this year as more people feel comfortable uh, being in person and you know, or hopefully get more comfortable with vaccinations. 
Um, I know that, you know, it's, it is an issue, but I think we're hand, IBTTA has handled it under Mark and will continue to handle it under me in a way that is respectful to all. Um, but those meetings just make you feel good. They make you feel good as a professional. You have some fun, you see your friends, uh, you learn, you have a few laughs. I mean, again, these are things that really hopefully gel organizations, right? When, when we laugh a little bit, you know, there's so many examples, whether it's Jimmy Valvano reminding us to think, to show emotion and passion and to laugh, right? Those three things we should do every day. Um, and when we get to IBTTA, we do that, right? We're very serious. We have serious conversations about important topics and our relationships with our members um, and our, the information we're able to share with, with our community. But then afterwards, you know, we, we have events where we go and have some fun, whether it's karaoke or, or you know, Rosa and I doing some really bad dancing, um, you know, to little Bruno Mars, whatever it may be. We kind of have that moment to just be who we are, just be, be people, not be a toll operator or a commissioner or an executive director, but just be, just be ourselves and, and have some fun. And I think we do that in a way that is different than most other organizations. This is Cafe IBTTA. Our guest is Diane gutierrez Cachetti. She's the commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Transportation. If you have a question for the commish, please type it in the chat line using all panelists and attendees or everybody, and we'll see if we can get to your question. Diane, we've talked about sustainability and resilience. And in another context, you said of, of that, that we will tackle it for the rest of time. We will tackle sustainability and resilience for the rest of time. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, it took us a really long time to have the impacts on the environment we've had. Um, whether, whether it's, you know, the incredibly um, odd weather patterns that we have, you know, we have uh, what California and the West Coast have gone through in terms of fire and now rain and, and uh, mudslides, or it's the North, Northeast and Mid-Atlantic that haven't seen tornadoes and winter thunderstorms. And I think just um, we have done damage, whether we like to believe it or not. Um, we've taken advantage of, of a resource, um, not knowingly and not with malice, but, but for lack of information at the time, that it's going to take us time to repair. Um, and unlike anything else, um, if, if we fix it and we can fix it, um, even after we do that, we are going to have to continue to be mindful so that history doesn't repeat itself. Right. And that's really when I say it's something we're going to live with forever. We are going to have to constantly be, be mindful of our environment, of our, our own personal health and the health of those around us, um, of our grandchildren and our great grandchildren and the generations after us. We are going to have to consider what we, how we build and what we build um, and how we can maybe sometimes use technology to um, avoid at some level, the, the hard building that we do. Um, it's a balance. And so we'll be doing that balancing act, I'm pretty sure, for as long as we're all in business. Diane, this is a busy week for you and for IBTTA. You've got uh, there in New Jersey, snowstorms ahead of you. Here in IBTTA, we've got the board meeting ahead of us, but we also have some important things behind us. Monday of this week, we honored the memory of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, it's a reminder of the continuing struggle to advance civil rights in America and around the world. And it also reminds us of how much we have yet to do. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is a major plank in IBTTA's new strategic plan. What are your thoughts about how we and other associations can maintain that passion and commitment to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion? I think the way we do it is, is one day at a time and one person at a time. Um, you know, sometimes I think when we talk about these really um, big umbrella topics, right there, you know, we talk about it as association. Um, some people feel like they don't know where to start. Um, how do you start? Well, you start one decision at a time, one person at a time, one policy at a time um, until you feel that you have opened, um, opened the agency, opened the association, opened the opportunity to everyone, right? And so there's, there's much to be gained um, 
by maintaining a lot of humility in this process. Um, we're, at a, we're just at a, a really difficult place in our society right now. And, it, and it's going to take each of us doing our part. It's not going to be, you know, well, only the commissioner should be worried about that or only the, um, only the you know, human resources folks should be worried about that. All of us, every one of us has to have an eye on our organizations for creating opportunity for everyone, every person. And for those who perhaps haven't had the good fortune of being able to achieve the qualifications for some of the higher level positions, then it is incumbent upon us to help them get there. And that's when I talk about resilience and leadership and opportunity, all of it is encompassed there, creating opportunities for other, being good leaders. You, know, you could have a small group in your organization. You may have three or four people that you work with, but you can be a leader in that group. You can help identify talent. Um, and that's a big deal, right? Identifying good talent, cultivating that talent, growing that talent, and then preparing it for, um, for the next steps. And I know, um, I think down at TRB last week, um, Wanda had an opportunity to meet a young man who works with me, um, who is passionate about transportation. And my job, as, as many of you have heard me talk about the book, Greater Than Yourself Project, the GTY Project, this young man is my GTY project in New Jersey. Um, I, I took him to TRB with me and basically introduced him to everybody that I could that I know. I want him to have a network that's broader than mine, that's bigger than mine. Um, he is in a minority category. He's a young man, um, but he is going to be phenomenal. His, when his day comes, I hope I'm sitting someplace where I can watch. We all have that responsibility to bring someone along. And if we can find someone who, and, and not just anyone, but someone who is passionate about what they want to do, someone who needs that opportunity, who just needs that to be lifted up that little bit, that's how we're going to make diversity, equity, inclusion reality. Not just some heady policies that we write and we read them and they sound good. It's actually all of us rolling up our sleeves and getting down and doing the right thing. I have a feeling this young man that you mentioned is already phenomenal. You know, I, I, I yeah. spoke with him on the phone and I thought, wow. This I is take no responsibility for that. He had great parents <laughs> and he's, he's, just, he's just a wonderful young man. We have a question from Yvonne Lopez Diaz. She says, I lived in New Jersey for many years before opting for the sun and sand in Florida. So a little piece of my heart is there. Mm -hmm. Diane, what is one priority project in New Jersey that will benefit from the infrastructure plan funds? So the biggest project in New Jersey that will benefit are the Hudson Tunnels. Um, some of you remember about 10 years ago, they were the Access to the Region Core project where they built an extra rail tunnel. Um, that's not a, a toll project, but it involves a toll road because it is through the power of tolling that we will be able to fund the Hudson Tunnels. And some people would say, well, that's counterintuitive. You're funding rail. Well, no, it's not. It's again, goes back to the whole conversation of resiliency and sustainability. Um, I, I don't think that the turnpike wants every transit rider in a car. Um, it would not be a good day on the turnpike from a traffic perspective. Um, and so in New Jersey, we try to look at how we balance the whole transportation system. How do we make it all work so that everyone, right? With all boats rise, rise in high tide. When, when it's all doing well, then we're all doing well. And the Hudson Tunnel is part of that. It's part of us helping to reduce our carbon footprint um, anybody who's been on the Garden State Parkway or the New Jersey Turnpike at rush hour on northbound into Manhattan is not usually happy if they're in a car. Um, and so we need to create capacity on a multimodal front um, to make sure that we can get people where they need to go. And when we do that and serve our customer well, um, then our customer doesn't feel quite as badly um, paying what they do to travel on our roads because they know we're making decisions that in the, are hopefully in their long-term best interest. Thanks, Diane. My next question is about technology, and I see we've got a question in the chat about technology. Everybody talks about how the future of our industry is tied up with technology. And I've heard you say that your car tells you when it's time to take a break. But smart technology is about more than having devices talk to us. It's about people. What are your thoughts about that? So 
you're right, Pat. I mean, we have cars today that tell us a whole lot of things to do. My my colleague was, you know, lamenting her lane departure um, technology that keeps trying to force her to go one way when she's really trying to do something else, right? And we get frustrated by it. But technology is something we need to to introduce to folks um, in a in a measured way so that they get comfortable with it. And technology is not just the technology we use to collect tolls. I, I think a lot about this is that we focus so much on being toll agencies, but we are major highways that this nation couldn't support if we didn't have tolling, right? If we had to put all these toll agencies on the back of USDOT, I mean, I don't know what the infrastructure bill would look like, actually, or the um, uh uh, double IJA. We have all kinds of names for it. I have trouble calling it a bill because it was a bill. It's not a bill anymore, but we've got all these acronym issues in this country. So for me, it's really teaching people about the technology that's most important for them, right? So as we get to more connected vehicles, and then we slowly graduate to automated vehicles, and they get more comfortable with each level, I think you know that that to me is the key to technology, and then us being able to use really good roadway technology um, to make sure that we can understand and measure and collect data on the success of some of those technologies. Are we reducing crashes? Is the technology we use um, helping us monitor speed better? Um, you know, we we had the worst year for fatalities last year, and it was a year when, from the pandemic standpoint, people weren't technically driving as much, right? They were still working at home, um, but speed became a huge issue. Um, and so we need to make sure that we use technology, all forms of technology, um, to make sure that everybody's safe, right? We have an expression here at DOT, everyone goes home every night and we do it using whatever we can, right? So good sense, good messaging, good technology. And I know that IBTTA has great members on the technology front that can help us with that and provide really insightful information to us about the state of tech, transportation technology in the industry. Diane, we have some famous people in our world who go by only one name, Cher, Madonna, Adele come to mind. Mm -hmm. There's somebody in your office who goes by one name, Mason. And I wonder yeah. if you could introduce us to this special individual. I can, hold on. Come here, bud. Okay, this is Mason. Mason is the COVID therapy dog of the New Jersey DOT commissioner's office. So I adopted Mason. He's a rescue. He's also apparently very tired. Um, a couple of years ago, and he has become the mascot of New Jersey DOT. And um, he has a little office here. He has his own little bed and his own little water bowl. And he has lots of folks who uh, just cuddle him and talk to him. And as adorable as he is and as precious as he is, um, he has done tremendous good work in, in keeping all of us uh, sane through, uh, through the pandemic. Uh, my office here, we've been coming to work every day. We, we didn't stay home at all. And um, so Mason was kind of our, our sanity when he'd wanna play football with you or he'd wanna eat some of your lunch. You know, he's got a lot of activities and then uh, obviously he's, it's very important for him to keep all of us safe. And he's a great little guard dog. He's nine pounds and he thinks he's 90. So that's Mason. Mason, it's great to see you again. And uh, welcome to Cafe IBTTA. It's great to have you with us. Diane, I'm going to make a couple of announcements and then I'll come back to you for some final words of wisdom. So don't forget to complete the survey that you'll receive at the end of uh, Cafe IBTTA. We always want to get better and hear your thoughts. Next week, a special edition of Cafe IBTTA on Thursday at noon Eastern time, US DOT perspective on implementing the Infrastructure Investments and Job Act. Charles, Sm Charles Small, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Intergovernmental Affairs with US DOT will be with us at that time. That's next Thursday at noon. The Technology Summit, March 20 through 22 and uh, Orlando, registration is open. Get your spot reserved right away. Also, May 15 through 17 in Denver, we have the Road Usage Charging and Finance Conference. We just launched the call for presentations last week. Check the IBTTA website for details on all of our meetings. So Diane, what final words of wisdom do you have for us before we sign off? Well, first, I just thank you for having me, Pat. I really, um, 
I really enjoy being here and talking with you about just you know, our business and who we are as an, as an association. Um, but for all of you that are on today, first of all, thank you for signing on. Thank you for being a part of Cafe IBTTA. And for me, uh, just remember to be kind to each other. You know, take, take a moment today to just make sure you check in with somebody, whether it's an old friend or a, a grandparent or a mom or dad or a sister or brother, just, just check in with them and make sure everybody's doing okay. And I think, you know, if we all just took a minute out of our day to do that, the world might be just a little bit happier than it is at the moment. So uh, love to all of you. Uh, can't wait to see you all in Orlando. We're going to definitely be in person, get to see some of you next month at Leadership Academy. Um, but Pat, I, again, just very grateful for being able to be here today. Diane, thank you so much for being here. It was great to have you. And I know I'm going to see a lot of you over the next three days. So mm -hmm. I'll see you soon. See and you to, all our, to all our viewers, be safe, keep in touch, and we'll see you down the road. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Diane, Mason. Thank